I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Peggy Wallace Kennedy is the daughter of George Wallace, whose name is often invoked in our current time of racial strife. Wallace's Alabama governorship and his 68 and 72 presidential bids fomented racial division. His daughter recounts her decision to confront her family legacy in The Broken Road, George Wallace and a Daughter's Journey to Reconciliation. Here's our February 2020 conversation. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is very appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo-Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as have our generation of forebears before us done time and again down through history. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Peggy Wallace Kennedy, that is one of the most famous clips of your father, four-time Alabama governor, four-time presidential aspirant. You've written a book about your life with him. What, what are you doing with the book, The Broken Road? What do you want to accomplish? Well, really, um, I wrote the book... Um, it's a culmination of the work I've done for the past 11 years, speaking up and speaking out for peace and reconciliation. So uh, the book is uh, really for uh, the legacy that I'm leaving for my two sons. But uh, the theme of the book is really um, how I came to, to terms with my past, not to forget my past, but to uh, accept my past. and. Um, Leaving a painful past behind is not always easy, but it's always right. Why do you think this book, beyond your family concerns, of course, because you want people other than your family to read it, why this book right now? Because I hope this book can be a, 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 cha- a hope for change in our divided America. Uh, I hope that it will give people uh, a chance to see that they can live uh, a life where they can overcome their painful past also, and that they can live an inspirational life and inspire others, too. Where did you get the title, The Broken Road? The Broken Road is actually a a physical place. When we were young uh, and things, uh, especially after the 58 governor's race, uh, things did not go so well after my father lost that race, and my mother um, took us to the broken road, and um, she would drive from Clayton to uh, through Tuscaloosa and over the bridge, uh, over the Black Warrior River, and she would say, look for the broken road. And it was um, an abandoned roadbed on the on the side of the road, and it was it was asphalt that was heaved up, and it was covered with kudzu vines and shrub trees, and we we thought it looked broken, so we named it the Broken Road, and it was very close to my grandparents' house, so mother would say, "Look for the Broken Road," and she, we would, and then she would turn down, and we knew that when we saw the Broken Road, that it meant unconditional love and kindness and no secrets and no angry voices and she turned down that road and I'd look for the house with the flowers on the porch and when I saw it I'd roll down my window and wave and happiness would wave me back and we were at my grandparents house. So the broken road is actually a positive for you because it led you to a safe place. Yes, and 
I wish everyone could have a broken road in their life. The subtitle of your book is A Daughter's Journey to Reconciliation. You mentioned you've been working on this for the past 11 years. What got you started? Well, um, back in 1996, we took our youngest son, Burns, who was nine at the time, to the Martin Luther King uh, Museum historical site in Atlanta. And we went to his church and to his grave, and then we went over to the museum, and it was being newly constructed at that time. And we were going through the exhibits, and we came to the exhibit, uh, Alabama exhibit, and it showed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the bombed out 16th Street Baptist Church, fire hoses and dogs in Birmingham, and George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. And Burns looked up at me and he said, he was so sad. Why did Pawpaw do those things to other people? And it broke my heart. And I said, Pawpaw never told me why he did those things to other people. But I know he was wrong, so maybe it will just have to be up to you and me to help make things right. And that was in 1996. So from 1996 to 2009, I raised my children. I supported my husband in his political career. And then I got invited to walk with John Lewis over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 2009. John, to walk with John Lewis over the Edmund Pettus Bridge was um, one of the greatest honors and privileges of my life. But John did something else for me. He showed me that unconditional love, reconciliation, and forgiveness can heal a human heart. But he also gave me the courage to find my own voice because uh, uh, when we were smaller, growing up in a political family, you didn't really have a voice because uh, or an opinion. No, never asked for opinion. And he, I knew that I knew I wanted to do something with that voice. So I decided that I wanted to speak up and speak out about peace and reconciliation. So I thought back about Burns's question. And I thought, maybe this would be a way that I could help in some way. So for the last 11 years or so, that's what my husband and I have been doing, is traveling all across the country, talking about peace and reconciliation. As you make your travels, what are your observations about the state of race relations in the country? Well, I think that we've come a long way but I think that um, I, th I think uh, things are slipping back. Um, I think that uh, America is somewhat divided. Uh, I think America's hurting right now. America's strong. Um, I think there's hope for America. But I. People, if people could see uh, other people with their hearts rather than their minds, uh, that would teach uh, l a lot of lessons of unconditional love. I think Dr. King's teachings are needed uh, now more than ever in our, in our world, especially in the United States. John Lewis says, we're one family. We're one America. America's about all of us, not just some of us. So I think we're somewhat divided, and we, we can't go back. We have to keep moving forward. But I think that it, it's not uh, as, as good as it, it should be. 
Clearly, they uh, walk with John Lewis across the bridge is so important to you because you both opened the book with it yes. and you closed the book with it. Yes. Uh, we found a piece of video from 1968 of your father on CBS News talking about his interpretation of what happened that day. Let's watch and we'll come back. I am not the chief aider and abetter to the breakdown of law and order or civil rights uh, programs, anything of that sort. In fact, in Alabama, contrary to what you might know, we didn't have any breakdown of law and order in that state. We had some demonstrations. No breakdown of no, law sir, and order no, in sir. Birmingham? No, sir. What breakdown of law and order came there? We had some demonstrations that put some water on some people and arrested some folks. Did they burn the city down? What, Did happened, break... after, what happened after the, the, the Selma disturbances? The Selma March, one woman was shot on the highway by some thugs. People are shot in Washington every day and in Philadelphia every day. But nobody got hurt in the march. And so what is your understanding after really studying it and even seeing it at the time of what really happened that day on the bridge? Um, those, um, Al Lingo and his posse and Sheriff Clark, they were ready, they came ready to beat those marchers. They wore gas masks, they had tear gas, they had bats that were wired, and uh, they, they were on horses, and they came to beat those marchers. And so that's what they did. And for my father not to have fired Al Lingo, arrested Sheriff Clark, and fire all those troopers that were on horses that uh, participated was a mistake. It was wrong. He should have done that, and he did not. Did you ever have an opportunity to challenge him on why he made those decisions? No, I didn't. Um, Where were you the day that it happened? Well, I was um, 15. Um, my mother and I were uh, at home watching a movie, and they cut in, and they showed the film, and she and I really didn't uh, say much about it, but then a little later we, we did talk about the man in the tan trench coat, because he seemed to be the one that had fallen back. And it was John Lewis because they had, um, they beat him severely. And we mentioned, uh, she and I mentioned later uh, on about the man in the tan tr uh, trench coat, not knowing that 50-something years later that I would call him brother and he would call me sister, not knowing. When did he, was that call to, to walk across the bridge the first time, was that the first time you'd met him or had you met him before? Yes. And, and did he reach out to you? Yes. Um, I was asked to come to Selma to introduce uh, then Attorney General Eric Holder because I had been uh, a, a great supporter of uh, uh, Barack Obama. And uh, I had written a uh, uh, an article for CNN, and it was um, um, uh, a big hit, <laughs> I guess you could say. And then, so uh, because of that article, they asked me to come, where I come and introduce him. And I had not given a speech since high school, so um, they put all the speakers in one room, and there was Joseph Lowry and Jesse Jackson, and uh, Eric Holder came in, and John Lewis. And John Lewis came over and sat next to me, and we started a conversation. And he, um, we've loved each other ever since. What is John Lewis's explanation for your father uh, when you've talked about why he approached uh, his his own citizens of his state, people of color, the way that he did? Well, how does John Lewis process the way your father handled things? You know, we've never we've never discussed that. He doesn't have an assessment of his his personality or what drove him along the way. Well, I think uh, yes, I, I, <clears throat> I've I've read things that John has. Uh, he not he didn't tell me personally, but I have read things that um, John uh, has said, and and he's John is right 
my father created a, a climate in Alabama um, with his words and actions uh, that made other people go out and uh, hurt people and uh, bloodshed and uh, and violence. And I've heard John, uh, I've read uh, many things where John said that. Your book is really um, not only your own personal memoir, but it's also the story of your father's political career. Um, and it really falls in three distinct parts. Uh, his early years, his path to national mm -hmm. prominence, and then the time after his shooting. And yes. I want to spend a little bit of time on each one of those. Okay. So let's start with the early years, because you contend that he didn't start out this way. So where was he born, and what were his early influences? Well, um, I think uh, he was born uh, um, in Clio, in Alabama, and his mother and father, um, his mother was uh, very stoic and very, uh, um, not very loving. Uh, his father was a, uh, was, um, a, a drunk. Um, uh, and died at the age of 40. Uh, his biggest influence, my father's biggest influence, was his grandfather, who was a doctor. And he uh, would let my father ride on the back of the, his horse and when he would go out into the rural areas and see patients. And uh, I think that was his biggest influence. But um, his mother was was driven um, in a way that um, I think that's where my father got his uh, being uh, later on being driven to be to be governor. Um, she was driven in ways that she she when she uh, met my uh, father's father. She was driven. Uh, she was going to marry him, and so she did everything she could to. Uh, get to marry him, so she did, and that's what was how she was driven, and that went over to my father. Your uh, father married your mother at a very young age, age of 16. How did the two meet? How did they meet? Um, she worked in a drugstore in Northport, and he went in and bought some hair tonic from her, and then he came out, and, and a friend was there waiting outside, and he bet... Um, my father bet I bet him that he could get a date with her, uh, and so he went back. My father went back in and found out her name and got a date with her. So, is it true that he told her at that very early part of his life that he was going to be Alabama governor yes. one day? Where did his interest in politics come from? I think from his grandfather, because as his grandfather would go in and take care of the patients, my father would stay outside and talk to the relatives, and he'd go around to each one, he would just talk, and he, uh, there'd be a crowd of, of the relatives, and he just, he loved the crowd, and I think that's where he got his interest, and I think he was just, um, he loved that, and he just loved talking to people, and I think that's where it came from. He had two early positions in state politics. One was as the youngest, to that point, state legislator, age 27. Yes elected right after he came back from World War II, mm -hmm. and then also as a circuit judge. Yes. What characterized his approach to public policy and public service in those days? How would you have described him? Uh, I, he was uh, very interested in, uh, and very concerned about uh, the poor, um, black or white. Um, he cared about people. Uh, he. Uh, wanted uh, a better life for those who uh, were less fortunate, uh, and that was the way that, that was the way he uh, he was. And um, up to that, up to the time that he um, ran for governor in '58, I think people would be somewhat shocked to read about the conditions that he left your family in as he was pursuing his political career yes. at this point. What was life like for your mother and your siblings? And you? well. Uh, up until '58, you know, we were very happy, and um, he was a, he was a judge, and uh, things were uh, okay. 
But after he lost that 58 race, he was very devastated, and um, he he would just be he'd be gone for days and days, and um, there was no paycheck coming in or anything. And mother took a small job there in Clayton, but it was it just wasn't enough, and so. Um, it, it was it was very difficult for her, and she uh, she she did the best she could, and um, but there was sometimes that we just did without, and but she did she did the very best she could. Did you have a sense of a ch as a child of of being poor? Uh, no, because my mother just had a way about her that made you feel that you were loved and. She comforted you in such a way that, no, you didn't feel that way. Even though you didn't have anything to eat, uh, she still comforted you, and you, you just you felt like you had everything. That's just the way she was. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I, I have uh, two sisters. One is, is deceased, and I have one brother. And where were you in the lineup? I was the second. Oh, I, our next piece of video is from the 1958 governor's race because you write in the book that that's what changed everything for your father's political yes. career and your family life. Yes. Let's watch. It's a pleasure always to come back to Mobile, Alabama. I feel very close to this great section of the state for many reasons. This is George Jr. coming up here, and this is Peggy, and this is Bobby, my first child, of course, born 13 years ago at Brooklyn Army Air Force Base Hospital here in Mobile, Alabama. So, did you, do you remember as a child going out campaigning with your father all the time? No. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't remember that one, but I've seen that clip many times. And um, I remember going to Montgomery on the night of the, of, of the returns in 58. I remember that because I remember the little slippers that my Aunt Bill gave me. <laughs> um, and then I remember, I remember uh, that, that he, law, he lost. And I, up to that point, um, I loved my daddy so much, and I just didn't think he could do, he could lose anything. And I was, I was devastated because I just, I couldn't believe that he had lost that. Uh, that that was my daddy, and he could do anything, but he lost, and I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, I was very, very upset. And um, he comforted me. So uh, some other things to know about that race because it was so important in changing his future direction. His opponent was John Patterson, and uh, how did Mr. Patterson approach the race, and why is it that your father father lost to him? Well. Um, uh, John Patterson was uh, uh, supported, uh, had the support of the Klan, and uh, uh, Alabama uh, wanted segregation, and so John Patterson uh, ran on that, and he was elected. My father uh, ran on good roads, better schools, but that's not what uh, Alabama wanted. So uh, John Patterson uh, and uh, pulled. They were in a runoff, and John Patterson pulled that one out. So what was your father's takeaway lesson from that race? He would do anything to win next time, and, and that's what he did. He um, chose power over principle, and he used uh, racism and segregation to win uh, the 62 governor's race. How long did it take for him to decide he was going to run again in 1962, and, and what was it like in your, in your family during those, those years when he was making that decision? Well, I think he decided the day after he lost that he was running. So things were, he was gone all the time. Things got very, very uh, bad and, uh, as, well as, in, as far as family life went. So my mother, um, in 59, she uh, uh, left him and took us to our grandparents. And um, she filed for divorce. And when she did that, then she realized she held all the cards. 
and she was the strong one. So um, he, eventually he came, he realized that he could not run that, that race without her. And so he came and got her, and they reconciled. And But the, he did run uh, by using racism and segregation because that's still what Alabama wanted and promised that he would stand in the schoolhouse door to block any African American um, that you know wanted to go to 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 school. So uh, that moment for your mother seems like a real moment of empowerment for her. Yes, uh, that she said he needs me, mm -hmm. and then she would hold the cards. How did she? Did you have a sense of her really changing at that point? You you could feel it and you could see it, uh, and then. Uh, she just um, was a very strong person after that, and she uh, it, it became um, uh, equal. Uh, she said, "We're equal now." So, um, and he agreed. She's so she said, "You know, I you're not going to ignore me anymore." <laughs> you know that kind of thing. So uh, it was. Uh, She'd been strong all along, but I think having to decide to go to the broken road, take us and leave, was really the best thing she could have done. And for him to realize that she had that she had left him with the children, and that he there's no way he could have run for governor with being a, being divorced and having children, you know, running around, you know, wondering where their daddy was. And she knew that she held all the cards. And when he came, like I said, when he came and got us, he knew it too. How did your family's life change going from a place where you were really almost impoverished to living in the governor's mansion? Well, it was it was like a fairy tale, and uh, it was it was wonderful. And I remember my mother saying. You can have anything you want to eat, and I don't know if that was her way of apologizing or for all those um, days in Clayton, or if that was just you know I think it was her way of apologizing. And but it was it was a, a, a wonderful time, and she was a wonderful first lady. And we all just, um, we just, uh, it, was, it, was one, it was wonderful. Your father was sworn in in January of 1963, and 1963 gets an entire chapter in your book because it was, it seems like history accelerated, a year of one momentous event yes. after the other. It was also the time when your father went national on June 11th with the standoff in the, yes. in the uh, State University mm -hmm. door. We have some video from that time we're going to watch. Now, therefore, I, George C. Wallace, as governor of the state of Alabama, have by my action raised issues between the central government and the sovereign state of Alabama, which said issues should be adjudicated in the manner prescribed by the Constitution of the United States, and now being mindful of my duties and responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Alabama, and seeking to preserve and maintain the peace and dignity of this state and the individual freedoms of the citizens thereof, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. <clears throat> I take it from that uh, statement that uh, you are going to stand in that door and that you are not going to carry out the orders of uh, this court and that you are going to resist us from doing so. Is that correct? I stand upon the statement. Ms. Kenny, there, people might be surprised to read in your book that you discovered that both sides, the Kennedy administration and your father's administration, orchestrated the outcome there. Well, they worked out, you know. Um, my father did not want any, any uh, um, uh, violence or anything to go on. And so I, I think that they worked out uh, a plan where he could stand in the schoolhouse door 
uh, and then they, he would uh, federalize the National Guard, and then uh, the general will come up and say, you know, you, ha- you, have, you have to move. I order you to move. And that was the plan, uh, because I think they were concerned, you know, um, well, if we arrest him, uh, um, do we pick him up, <laughs> physically pick him up? I mean, there was just a lot uh, that they had to consider, you know. And um, Carrie Kennedy and I are very good friends um, today, and um, uh, I admire her father so much. And so um, we've often talked about about that. And um, uh, I th- it, well, it was um, my father got to do what he wanted to do. Um, and uh, Vivian and James got to register. And then uh, my father did um, uh, uh, put, put security uh, on campus for both of them. The uh, outcome that the Kennedys probably wouldn't have wanted is what happened, though, but he made his debut on the national stage, and it really incited his ambition. So it wasn't that after the Kennedy assassination later that year, he made his first bid for president, 1964. But he had a problem back at home because he was term limited. And you said that's when he came up with the audacious plan for your mother to succeed him. How much did she want to do this? Well, my mother um, wanted to run. And she called each one of us children in one at a time and asked our opinion. And I did not want her to run. But she said, Peggy, I want to do this. This is something I want to do. And so um, it wasn't until years later that I found out that she um, she had cancer. Did she when know? When she announced. Did that, she know she had yes, cancer? She, she knew, yes. And she um, had enormous success, 54% of the Democratic vote in the primary with 10 candidates and overwhelming success, of course, in the in, uh, election. She Was she popular with voters or was it a proxy vote for your father? It, it, that she was very popular with the, with the voters, very popular on her own. She, um, when they would campaign, she would, they would go out, she would speak a few minutes off of some cards, and then Daddy would be the main attraction. Well, as the campaign progressed, my mother would speak a little bit longer, a little bit longer. She, she built that confidence up, and then she became the main attraction and then got to where Daddy didn't speak at all, really. So um, she became very popular with um, uh, all of Alabama, all Al- Al- Alabamians because she was just so genuine and personable. So uh, while she was serving, your father made his first serious bid in 1968 for the presidency, running under the rubric of the American Independence Party. What did they stand for? Well, I'm not sure. (laughs) I'm not sure. I know that he... uh, His message was stand up for America. Yes. uh, So what was he talking about on the campaign trail at that time? Well, I think he was talking to um, the, your, your white um, uh, middle class uh, person who really f- felt like they didn't have uh, a dream of any kind. Uh, and here was a candidate that said, I can give you a dream, that dream back. I'm going to stand up for America. But then there were no solutions. Uh, given, you know, Stand Up for America was really kind of a coded message, really. So, um, but now he was, uh, in 68, he was able to get on ballot in every state. Which is, people should know that's a, a very difficult Very challenge. difficult to do, and he had a great organization that, did, that worked uh, day and night, and he got on every... Uh, on the ballot in every, st- in every state. So in May of that year, not too long after he started, your mother, Governor Lurleen Wallace, passed away, age yes. 41, of cancer. Yes. Uh, what was her legacy as governor? She, 
um, she is probably be the most beloved uh, woman ever in um, in Alabama. And she, you were just 18 at the time that she passed. Um, yes. a, a bit of a difficult question, but what is her legacy to you? Wow. Um, everything that I am that I have instilled in my children compassion personal well everything she was is my legacy is her legacy to me and I have instilled that in, in my children I don't know how to explain it because she lived she lives she lived only till she was 41 I just turned 18 but she taught me so much in in that span little span of time that's the only way I know how to explain it your father went back on the campaign trail and I just want to tell people how the 1968 election turned out for him he won five southern states 13 percent of the popular vote 40 electoral college votes um, you said that he never had any illusions about winning the race what what was his goal he just liked to run he liked he just liked to um, He liked the people. He got he'd gotten on every uh, the ballot in every state, and I think he just um, wanted to see what what he could do, and and that's you, that's what he did. And I think he was pleased with that. He already had his sights set on running again in 1972, mm -hmm. uh, but first he had to be reelected governor in the state. And the uh, you tell a story of the Nixon administration's involvement in that race. Can you tell me that story? Well, I think that um, some money changed hands from the Brewer people, from his, the Nixon his opponent. people, mm -hmm. to the, uh, his opponent, Brewer people. And so um, that was, uh, that, and that was, <laughs> the, pretty much the gist of it. So you tell a story of cash payments going to the Brewer campaign, mm -hmm. and then there was also an IRS investigation started against your father. Yes, uh, against my uh, uncle, mm -hmm. Uncle Gerald. And so um, I think maybe um, things were worked out in the end, <laughs> and the I I IRS uh, investigation was dropped. Um, and your father decided not to run as an uh, independent, as an independent, but instead run as a Democrat. So yes. you're suggesting there might have been a deal there. <laughs> I think so. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Yes. And, uh, and by 1972, when he went on the campaign trail, uh, were you tr campaigning with him at that point? No, I, I was not. I was. Um, what was his style like in 1972? Well, um, he uh, had a new wife, uh, and we loved her, Cornelia. So she had him all. Uh, you know, all stylish and everything. Um, but he was very serious about that '72 race, and um, uh, he he was um, uh, he he was very popular, and um, was going to uh, win a lot of states, and um, and unfortunately, uh, I think he, he was shot on a Monday, and the next day on a Tuesday, I think he he, he won. Uh, Michigan, and uh, I'm not sure, uh, three or four states that next day. Yeah, he, in fact, before the, that, he had already won every county in the Florida primary. And uh, then there was that day in May 15th, 1972, in Laurel, yes. Maryland, just yes. up the road from where we're speaking right now. We have um, some video from that from PBS's American Experience back in 2000. We're going to watch and then okay. come back. It was a very calm crowd, very nice, congenial crowd. Everything just seemed really nice. So he came down and he started shaking hands. The Secret Service agent in charge asked Wallace not to go into the crowd. That's all right, Wallace said. I'll take the responsibility. And then all of a sudden I heard, 
dot, 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 dot. And in time, just stood still. I thought they'd shoot him again. And so I jumped on top of him, trying to cover up his head and his heart and his vital organs, his lungs. And uh, there just wasn't anybody around him. Although you've lived through that experience, and I know you've seen that many times, what's it like to watch that? It's very difficult to watch. It's very difficult, yes. So the next day, he not only won those two primaries, but he found out that he was going to be paralyzed for the rest of his life. So what happened in the immediate aftermath? How did he begin to put his life back together? Well, uh, it was very difficult. Um, uh, You know... um, Um, we, um, they wanted to come, him to come to the convention, speak at the convention in Miami, so, um, once he was well enough to do that, we went there, and then he went straight to, um, from there to, uh, Spain rehab in, um, Birmingham. We stayed there, and then we went home, and, um... It, uh, you know, it was just very, very difficult for Cornelia. It was difficult for me. My daddy and I were very, very close. We loved each other very much, um, and it was it was just very difficult. And, um, Did most people in the political world assume that this would be the end of his career? I'm sure they did, yes, yes. And yet he had two more terms as governor and another presidential run. Where did he get that from, the fortitude to keep going? It's just, it was just built in for him. And then I think he had uh, a lot of uh, supporters and a a lot of um, people that said, you can do this, you can do this, uh, whether you're paralyzed or not. In 1974, he won his next election as governor of Alabama by the largest percentage that he had had in his political career. What do you think um, the people of Alabama were saying to him? And also, how able was he to govern at that point? I think they were saying, uh, we love you still, and we know that you can do uh, what you've always done for Alabama and that's to make Alabama better, like you've always done. And we have faith in you. And I think that was good for him. But he was in persistent pain by this point. And, yes. And what about drugs and alcohol? Were they part of his life? Uh, um, he, yes, the drugs. Uh, he was um, became addicted to um, the painkillers. And so um, he had to be weaned off, weaned off that. So that was uh, very, very difficult, very difficult to watch. In 1976, despite the pain, he thought about running for president again, made a bit of a, an early bid. Uh, an interesting, just small note in that chapter is that Jimmy Carter, who uh, was seeking the nomination, wanted an endorsement from your father. Does yes. that surprise you, what you know about Jimmy Carter? No, it, it didn't. Mm-mm. No. And he won that endorsement. Yes. Your father endorsed uh-huh. Jimmy Carter. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, after uh, the 1978 election, he was term limited once more, and his third marriage was coming to an end. Um, you write that this is where you think his heart really began to change. What was happening? I, th- I, I think that... Um, I think his I think his change started uh, when he got shot, and then it just slow it slowly uh, just just started changing. And um, um, he he was um, he would he was just a in his heart. Uh, I, I knew him well, and I, I, I could see it in his eyes. And uh, when Shirley, 
when Congressman Shirley Chisholm came to visit him in the hospital when she, uh, she came, and Ethel K- Kennedy also came, I saw something in his eyes that, w- that were different. And, and, at, and through the years after that, I could just see a change in him. It was sl- slow, and it was, um, it was it was beautiful to watch. Um, his personality was changing, and he was becoming the man that I knew and the father I knew in 1958. And at the last two years of his life, he would have Mark and I come over late at night. He wanted to talk, you know. And he would um, talk about how wrong he was about race and segregation. He did most of the talking, and uh, and he'd talk around those points, you know. And Mark was a judge, and he'd been a judge, and so they, they had a lot in common. And it was just... It was we were so close and we loved each other so much that was that his, that was his way of having us over time and time again of his way and the only way that he was capable of asking for my forgiveness of the way that he had made my life difficult. And I forgave him because I knew that was the only way he knew how. And I loved him for that because my father loved me the very best that he could. He learned how to love from his mother the best that he could. And I never asked for any more than he could give me. He also reached out to African American leaders and asked them for forgiveness yes. too. We we found a, a clip in our video library of John Lewis talking about how he forgave your father. Okay. Let, let's watch. I saw George Wallace a, as a brother, a bull Connor, a sheriff Clark, and I, I make to, to mention my little book, Welcome with the Wind. And when you see someone and look in the eye of, of a member of the clan, of someone that is beating you, you have to think that at some point, this person was a little child, somebody, a little baby. When I, they didn't come in, into this world hating and putting people down because of their race or color. And something happened. And we all have to have the power and the capacity to be able to forgive and to understand. He was reelected in 1982 to his fourth term with a great deal of help from black voters in the state of Alabama. What's the lesson to be drawn from that? Forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness. Generally asking for forgiveness. Admitting that you have caused pain for other people, for the, for the acts that you have done, and you ask for that forgiveness, and you are, uh, you are forgiven. From a policy perspective, um, how did he use his last term to right some of his earlier wrongs? Well... He um, appointed more African Americans to government jobs in Alabama than any governor ever has or had or or has since, and and in in his cabinet too. We have our, our last piece of video is from your father himself, and this is from. 1986, and it is a News 10 special from Mobile uh, that is Wallace, the end of an era, uh, having him talk about his record. Let's watch. In 1973, 10 years after fighting the integration of the University of Alabama, he crowned the school's first black homecoming queen, 
Congratulations here, you're a mighty pretty queen. And by 1979, he had come full circle, admitting what some say he knew all along. He was wrong. I believe it was in the best interest of white and black uh, to be uh, in a segregated school system. But I was wrong. And once we lost the legal battles, I think we all saw we were wrong. I was wrong. So the the truth is that when he was running for office, and then especially when he was running for the presidency, millions of people heard his messaging. How many people do you think heard his admission of his wrong, uh, his uh, being wrong, and that his path to reconciliation was that covered as much as his campaign was earlier? Probably not. But um, we hope the people that heard him went out and told other people, because he was certainly uh, genuine, and it was, uh, um, it, it was, he was telling the truth. It was from his heart. So if you look at the full arc of George Wallace's life, from his early days uh, to really finding the path to power through uh, racial prejudice, and then coming full circle back to a point of seeking reconciliation, what do you think George Wallace's legacy ought to be in our society? Well, he'll always be the segregation governor that stood in the schoolhouse door. That will always be. But I would think, I would hope that his legacy would be coming full circle, that he had the capacity to change and say that he was wrong because he was wrong. And uh, he knew it, and he admitted it, and he said it, that he was wrong. You've been talking about this issue, as you said, for 11 years, but writing a book is a very different kind of process. What did you learn about your father, and what did you learn about yourself by writing the book? Oh, my goodness. Um, I knew I wanted to leave a legacy different to my two sons than, than was left for me. Um, I learned that, uh, that my father and I loved each other so much. Sometimes it was complicated and sometimes it was painful, but that we loved each other very much. And um, uh, I know that he would be proud of me I know that for myself, but I know it because John Lewis told me so. And that was nice to hear. Your uh, husband, um, Justice Mark Kennedy, partnered with you on this book. Yes. You never told us how you two met, by the way. How did you meet? We met on, on a blind date. And how long have you been married? 46 years. And yes. what, what was his role in this project? Well. <clears throat> we just uh, uh, put our thoughts together. I mean, he's lived 46 years uh, of the broken road with me, so he had a lot uh, of ideas and, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, memories and uh, th that, that kind of thing. So um, when I started talking about my grandparents, uh, he fell in love with my grandmother. So um, I wrote about her. He just loved her. And uh, uh, he helped me a lot on, on, on the difficult times that I had to write. Uh, he, would, he would help me with those uh, chapters. And sometimes I had to kind of take a break, you know, from chapters. But he, he, he was right there with me. And my two sons have been very supportive. Very supportive. One of your two sons came with you for this interview today. How have your sons reacted uh, to this book, its publication, and to your reception as you travel? Well, the, of course, the book is dedicated to them, and they've been uh, very excited, and they're very proud of, of me. And uh, But I'm very proud of them, because if it hadn't been for Burns' question, there would not be a book. And that's, why did Popo do those things to other people? In your mind, what would be the best thing that could come out from this entire book project? That people would um, like I said, learn 
learn to see other people with their hearts rather than their minds. And that would teach them the lessons of unconditional love. We all, we need to believe in ourselves and we need to believe in our neighbor again. And believe in, uh, we all have causes, we all have dreams, that we all have a history because we're unique and that's the fabric of our lives. Peggy Wallace Kennedy, the book is called The Broken Road, George Wallace and a Daughter's Journey to Reconciliation. Thank you for telling C-SPAN your story. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.